say motor basics is no, I am not an expert on motors by any means. Uh, I've been in the field. I've learned a lot of this because I had to. Okay? Y'all know where I'm coming from on that one, I guess. I think. You know, Craig, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit. Oh. And Billy, because y'all are salespeople. What's the PO number? That's the only number I really need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and when you go into a, a, a parts house and you carry the motor with you, a lot of times they may not have the motor that, that's exactly like you need. And they're going to try to match it up or do something of that nature with you to get you what you need to do the job. Well, sometimes that works, sometimes it don't. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to give you some of the basics, or try to go over some of the basics of what you're going to see on the motors out there. A lot of you, like I said earlier today, I said this is like a <coughs> preacher uh, trying to talk to a room full of preachers. So, y'all correct me, and this might be quite often when I'm wrong. Please do, because we don't want false information out there, okay? All right, what I've done is I've tried to break the motors down into what we see out there mostly. Now, I'm, if we get time, I'm going to go over a couple of others, but most of the motors that we use are induction type motors. Anybody know what induction means? Induction type motors. Okay. If you look at a, <coughs> most of the motors that we have, the rotor, the part that turns, is not going to have any wires in it. Okay. Magnetism is induced into the rotor. Okay? When you get into some uh, other type motors and all, you'll find out that they may actually have uh, uh, wiring in the, in the rotor part, the armatures it's sometimes called. Well, we say that it's magnetism, it's also currents that are, are actually induced into here. But we're going to be dealing with mostly uh, induction type motors. There will be an exception at the very end, but most of it's going to be induction type motors. And learning a little bit of the basics about that is going to help us all. I'm looking for that right there. The simplest is a shaded pole. This is a shaded pole motor here. Okay, if you can actually look at the, the uh, windings, you will actually see a copper bar on each side of one of the windings. Without that copper bar, it would never turn. What happens if you're looking at the shaded pole, and you're looking at the way that the schematic of it's going to look, it's going to be like that right there. AC motor, it doesn't matter which, how you hook it up, it's still going to turn the same direction. It's going to turn towards the shaded pole. So how do you reverse one? You <coughs> physically take it apart mm -hmm. and turn the Depends on whether you want to call it the rotor or the strider, whichever you want to do. But reverse the direction. That's what you're doing is reverse the, uh, how it's in there and it'll run the other way. Now, <laughs> a little bit of humor here. I had uh, somebody ask me, uh, how do I reverse a double shafted motor? I didn't know the answer. Y'all, you're in the but I have, I have been asked that before, okay? <laughs> and it kind of hit me like, do what? <laughs> okay. Yes. But, nope. uh, yeah, you know. Well, let's, I tell you what let's do. Let's talk about the applications of a shaded pole motor. Where are you going to see those? In this industry in particular. Small units. Small units. A lot, a lot of the fan motors are going to be shaded pole. They have a very, very low starting torque. If we'll take that motor and say that it's torque, is 100% and we're going to base our other motors on that, okay? But these things are not made to crank up under hard loads they won't. Uh, they do, don't get me wrong, they're very important in our industry, no doubt about it, but they are usually going to be fractional horsepower motors. Very simple. Their operation, very basic. It does, if you look at the sine wave, what happens is you have the sine wave coming in like so. But it's, if it doesn't have that shade in there, it's nothing to offset that magnetism so it'll start turning. It's kind of like a cart with both people pushing or pulling uh, objects of one another. Nothing's going to happen. It's just going to sit there. 
you put that little bit of the shade on there, change the magnetism that's induced in there, and you get the rotation started. Very simple, very simple. Okay, moving on to the next, we're going to a split phase. Split phase actually has a start winding. This is a split phase motor right here. Kind of hard to pass this one around, but you wouldn't see this on a compressor motor, and the reason being because we have a centrifugal switch when it gets up to about 70, 75 percent of its RPM, these weights are going to sling out, centrifugal, that's where it gets its name, and it's going to open up the switch to the start windings. If it stays in there, for more, if the start winding stays in there for more than about three seconds, it's usually going to wind up doing damage. So it's got to get up to its speed pretty quick. Well, if we were looking at the schematic of that, we're going to see a uh, run winding and a start winding, but one of them is going to have the centrifugal switch in it, like so, normally closed, if you will. That'll be our neutral, if you will, and L1 back over here. So you got a start winding, or excuse me, a run winding and a start winding. Okay, how do you know whether or not that centrifugal switch is working? Listen. Okay, you're here to click off. And if it doesn't click off, it's going to start pulling high amps. But, where do you see these? Usually on belt drives. How much torque does it have? Generally speaking, that's going to increase our starting torque. And I've got to look at my notes because I don't remember everything. I'm not like Steve, Steve Wright. You know? <laughs> Your dad, he remembers everything. Don't you? <coughs> you better say yes. It's on tape. That's right. Okay. Uh, normally, that uh, split phase is going to be about twice the starting torque of the uh, of a, a shaded pole that's similar in size. You know, horsepower, we talk about horsepower. I, I have a problem when I start talking about horsepower of motors because if we go back and we look at what a true horsepower of the motor is, it would be 746 watts. You'll find out the smaller motors are going to use more than that to do the job. The efficiency, if you will, is not going to be there in the smaller motors. Now, why? I don't know. I don't know that answer. But I do know that if I'm figuring a load, <coughs> electrical load, I look at a motor instead of horsepower and 746 watts, I'm going to put 1,000 watts there. And I'll find out that it will use more or, or closer to that than the other. All right. But basic operation of the split phase, it cranks up, gets the load going. And next thing, the uh, start winding drops out, runs on the run winding. Okay? All right, our next one, which is uh, taking pretty much the same motor. In fact, I'll just point over here to it. Hey, Dave. Uh -huh. hey, quick, going further. <clears throat> on that one, say your, um, your triple switch doesn't open, you're going to run high amp, right? You're going to run high amps. It's going to, uh, and so then you'll, you'll basically, there's no other protection on this particular split phase motor. Most of your motors are going to have internal uh, overloads, or an overload of some type. It may not be internal. Some, some nowadays are embedded in the windings. And uh, if it gets above temp, it will open it up. And with that thought in mind, that, that is where you, what you was asking, right? Yes. Okay. But with that thought in mind, can you tell me where you would not want an automatic reset? Okay. Think about that one. A lot of things out here use motors that that may be in, inside our field or outside our field. If we are if we're working on a blower and it's off on internal overload, you, you don't want to be sticking your hands in it because it may come right back on. But most of them are automatic. They're not going to be manual reset. But what about a table saw? You wouldn't want a table saw to have an automatic reset. So think about that when you're replacing motors, and that's what this is about because we don't. We're, we need to understand what to replace a motor with. You know, the best thing is to go back with what's there, but you can't always do that. And having an understanding of what its job is to do will help us decide what's right for the application. Make sense? All right. Uh, need a little more power? Well, you put a start capacitor in. Start capacitor cannot stay in the circuit very long. 
They're high microfarads. Have a, most of the time they're going to be going to look similar to this right here, high microfarads, but it's not made to dissipate heat. You run uh, run capacitors are going to have a steel body to them. That's so that they can get rid of the heat. They're oil filled. These are pasted. Okay. Now. I hadn't said anything about the uh, run capacitors yet, but we will. But uh, <clears throat> if that start capacitor stays in there too long, it's going to overheat, it's going to smoke, and it's going to smell awful. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. That sounds right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, when we need a little extra power, we go to the CRS. Like I said, we put this uh, in here. What actually happens, and I didn't go in this into a whole lot of detail, but what actually happens with your motor if you're looking at the sine wave, you have the AC going here. This is what the run winding would see. Because the, of the uh, inductance is created with the longer or more wire, less in size, smaller size, you get a phase shift. And you're going to actually see a phase shift like that on the start side. So that's what gives it turning ability. That's where it gets its torque to get started, is that phase shift. Okay. If you're looking at that on oscilloscope, it's kind of interesting. And uh, you'll find out that the capacitor will help boost it a little bit. And I'm going to show you what happens there, or exactly how it happens there when we get to the uh, PSC, which is next up. PSC, we're actually looking at something very similar to this right here with our run and our start. Again, we have the common L1, but this time we put us a start capacitor, I mean a run capacitor in it. Run capacitor stays. Okay, it gives it the torque needed to get it going, but it does something else. Everything's about efficiency now, right? right? We're looking for things to be efficient. Okay, there's my sine wave coming in. By having that capacitor in there, I'm going to show a shift on the start wind. The start wind is going to have high enough resistance that it doesn't pull too many amps, doesn't overload the motor. But how do we get the efficiency here? Well, let me just put it this way. Think of an automobile. You're starting off at zero at a red light. You go to the next red light, you have to stop. You start off again, get up to speed, come to that next red light, you stop. Going through Griffin. That sounds that sound like you know, I always going to catch up very lightly. Same thing. Well, what is happening right here? Nothing. Nothing at all. It's off. It's dead. If I keep applying some power to it, then I keep it moving. It's more like I come to that red light. I might slow down a little bit, but I don't stop. I got the green to go ahead. Which, which way am I going to get better gas now? Keep going. Keep going. That's the way the PSC works. Now, it's not a high torque motor. It falls in, <clears throat> it falls in line with the uh, other two we talked about. It's going to have about 200% starting torque. In other words, you wouldn't want to use this if you had a large mass that you needed to get going. It's just not going to happen. Now, I hear on condenser fan motors, and uh, fans in particular, you hear people say, well, that thing, I just turned it a little bit and it started running. Chances are you've got a bad capacitor. Now, capacitors today, I'm seeing more capacitors die than ever before. And the reason being is because of what they're made of. A lot of the materials that we used in the past, we can't use anymore. PCBs. Yep. Mm -hmm. And my understanding, a lot of the capacitors are now using glycol. Y'all know what glycol is? Yeah. Amphrase. Now these things look like they're sealed. And I agree. Don't light nothing to leak out of there. But my understanding is that it actually evaporates to a certain point. Glycol is a dielectric. And that's what helps separate the plates in there. Well, if I start losing the dielectric, I've got a problem. Instead of having any path at all for it to move through, I lose that path. Okay? Uh, you know, what can we do about that? Check your capacitors. Just because the capacitor 
is still working good or looks like it's working good, it doesn't hurt if you got a motor problem that's overheating to actually get a capacitor checker, which they're easy to do nowadays. Most meters have them on there. Actually check the capacitance and see if it's close to the rated right point. Okay? Usually, usually on a run capacitor you're allowed plus or minus 10% on whatever it's rated right at. So, so that's some things to look at so far. Now, I'm going to talk about one we don't see a whole lot in the field. These are virtually non-existent nowadays. That's a capacitor start, capacitor run mode. You just don't see them out there. I don't know why, but it takes the beauty of having the starting torque and the beauty of having efficiency. Puts it together, what does it mean? I've got a start capacitor and I've got a run capacitor. Now, I said you don't see them out there. You don't on fan motors and things, but guess what you do see? Compressor motors. See a lot of those, right? Okay. And to kind of jump a little bit about compressor motors, how many of these type systems do you see used on compressor motors? Well, you're not going to see one that is used as